Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the IEA's presentation of our in-depth report, uh, in-depth review uh, of Spain's energy policies. Uh, we're delighted today to be joined by Teresa Rivera, the Minister for the Ecological Transition of Spain. We will be hearing uh, first from our Executive Director, Dr. Fati Birol, and from Divya Reddy, our energy analyst, who will be presenting the findings from the report, followed by comments uh, from Madam Minister, after that, we have uh, time for a Q&A uh, with members of the press for this media launch. I would like to remind our audience that we are being uh, live streamed and that the report is available on our website. Okay. With that, Dr. Birol, I would like to turn the floor over to you. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, greetings to uh, everybody from the International Energy Agency headquarters in Paris. It's a great honor and pleasure to present uh, our uh, report on Spain together with the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Ecological Transition, uh, Ms. Teresa Ribera. Uh, Teresa, very nice to uh, see you uh, again. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, at the IEA, we conduct uh, so in-depth policy reviews of our member countries every five, uh, six years to see uh, how their energy policies are developing with a, a wide range of experts from different governments uh, around the world and uh, provide some uh, comments, suggestions and recommendations in order to help them to uh, better their energy uh, policies. In, uh, for Spain, uh, we have conducted our review uh, last uh, October and there was a, a multinational team led by a colleague from the UK uh, government, as well as colleagues from Portugal, Denmark, Austria, Netherlands, European Commission, NEA, and the uh, IES Secretariat. My colleague, Divya Reddy, uh, was uh, the desk officer uh, for that work. I am thankful to uh, uh, the Spanish government, uh, especially Ministry for Ecological uh, Transition, for the excellent cooperation uh, during our uh, review uh, and in fact throughout the process. During the two weeks of uh, intensive discussions, uh, my colleagues uh, met with several stakeholders, uh, not only the Minister of Ecological Transition, but other ministries, regulators, energy companies, associations, system operators, consumer groups, academia, NGOs, and uh, I would like to thank all of them for uh, their uh, uh, cooperation. And again, the recommendations and uh, critics are that of the International Energy Agency. Now, we thought uh, the following. I will give a brief uh, picture of how we see the uh, global energy and climate uh, issue uh, today with two, three uh, slides. And afterwards, uh, my colleague, uh, Mrs. Reddy, will give some of our findings. And at the end, I will come up with some recommendations before uh, hearing uh, Madam Deputy Prime Minister's uh, uh, views about our uh, review. So if I can uh, start uh, with the Reda, in my view, uh, a, a bad news, which is we look every year, uh, we are an organization of data. We have all the energy and emissions data at our fingertips. And uh, what we have seen that the uh, last year, global emissions declined badly. And we hoped uh, that the, uh, and we made some suggestions in that respect, especially in terms of sustainable recovery plans, so that 2021, we shouldn't see a rebound of the emissions. But, but uh, we have announced only a month ago that this year, unfortunately, we expect a huge rebound of global emissions. The second largest in the history, the, the increase of uh, emissions, which is Definitely a bad alarming uh, news. Uh, and this tells me uh, that the, in many countries around the world, 
there is a growing gap between the rhetoric and the reality in the markets. So this is the unfortunate, the bitter reality. We are seeing the second largest increase in emissions uh, this uh, year. Now, it is the reason, uh, one of the reasons why we just uh, published uh, only a week ago a report uh, for the uh, Net Zero 2050 global report for the global energy sector. What we have done is that the many governments around the world, starting with the European Union being the champion there, but also UK government, Canada, US, Japan, Korea, uh, uh, China, and the others are coming with 2050 net zero pledges and commitments. This is, of course, an excellent uh, news. But uh, we wanted to uh, translate, if I may say so, those pledges in the energy sector, what needs to happen so that we, uh, the governments, in fact, I should say, reach their targets. Because to put a target is good, but how to reach the targets, what concrete energy policies need to be put uh, there is uh, something uh, we are keen uh, to see in order to make the governments around the world accountable to their pledges, uh, we have uh, looked at what needs to happen in the energy sector. So if I can uh, uh, summarize very briefly, we see three major tasks in front of us. Number one, to make the most of the existing clean energy options, such as solar, such as wind, such as energy efficiency, such as electric cars, to make the most out of it, especially in the, uh, within this uh, decade, give a big boost to that. Second task we have, sim uh, uh, the, at the same time with the first one, we have to push the button for innovation and uh, make some of the uh, technologies which are under development being a part of the market, such as advanced battery technologies, different hydrogen applications. Uh, the, if you look at this, for example, how you use hydrogen, iron, steel, and uh, others, or uh, direct air capture and others. So this is the second big chunk of the uh, 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 emission reduction need to come, especially around 2030 and afterwards from this, of course, still renewables efficiency playing the, uh, the uh, having the lion's share. The third task we see is that there needs to be a dramatic decline in the use of fossil fuels. Oil, gas, and coal need to decline uh, sharply in order to reach this uh, target. So we see three big, uh, again, uh, tasks to make the most out of the existing market-ready technologies. Second, prepare the advanced technologies, push them in the market, we're under development today. And third, uh, a significant substantial decline of the fossil fuel use. So when you look at our report, uh, you will uh, see uh, that the today's world, which is dominated by fossil fuels, about 80%, will need to change substantially in 2050 where the clean energy will dominate the global energy mix. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, this is our uh, report. And we also look at the economic implications, job implications uh, of those in our report. And uh, to make sure that given the governments the uh, the inspiration we also came up with over 400 milestones what needs to be done and when they have to be done just to give you a, a bit of a, a, a flavor just uh, picking a, a few of them for example as of uh, uh, this year 
no new unabated coal plants uh, uh, approved. I am very happy that the G7 uh, governments uh, taking the IEA work, our work as a reference, came up with a very strong conclusion uh, there. Or uh, we also say uh, that the, as of 2035, no more uh, combustion engine car sales uh, around the world. Or in 20, uh, 2040, 50% of the fuels used in aviation should be sustainable. More and more and more, and this ends up uh, with the very important, in my view, conclusion that if those demand side policies are implemented, there will not be a need for new oil and gas fields uh, development, as well as there will be no need for uh, new coal uh, mines uh, around the world. So this is our uh, 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 Net Zero 2050 roadmap. And I am happy that uh, within the last uh, week only, uh, uh, several governments uh, got in touch with the IEA to work together to set up the milestones, to help those countries set up the milestones for their own economies. Of course, uh, uh, these developments uh, happen, and uh, we at the IEA do not uh, forget that the clean energy transitions are for and about the people. It is the reason uh, I have convened a, a global commission on people-centered uh, clean energy transitions in order to uh, see that the, these net zero goals uh, are not going to hurt people because of the transition, losing their jobs, uh, facing some economic uh, hardships. And uh, we have... Uh, it is going to. It is chaired by the Prime Minister of uh, uh, Denmark, and we have uh, several uh, ministers around the world and uh, uh, other uh, distinguished uh, policy uh, makers, and the representatives of the uh, labour, youth, and uh, civil uh, society. And I am uh, honoured that the uh, uh, Madam Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, is also part of our uh, global commission. And we are uh, very happy uh, as uh, she uh, uh, made miracles, if I may say so, in terms of the addressing the coal mining uh, issue and uh, supported the impacted uh, communities and uh, workers. So uh, we see, a, we are aware that if we make this clean energy transitions, it is for people and about people. So we are very keen uh, that the, this issue will be a critical issue for COP internationally and also uh, for uh, different governments uh, around the world. With this, uh, I would like to finish this global picture. I will come back again with the recommendations to Spanish government, but I would like to give the word to my colleague, Mrs. Uh, Divya uh, Red. Divya. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Birol. So now I'll provide a brief overview of the main findings from our report. So uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So since the last IEA in-depth review in 2015, Spain has solved a longstanding issue of tariff deficits in ele its electricity and gas sectors and closed all of its coal mines, which has allowed it to prioritize the issue of climate change on its national agenda and align its goals with, with EU ambitions. Most of Spain's energy supply and demand is still currently met with fossil fuels, which accounted for 72% of total energy supply in 2019. But the share of renewables has significantly increased in the past decade, reaching 15% of total supply in 2019 and 38% of electricity generation. Transport is the largest energy consuming sector, mostly consisting of oil, and is also the largest contributor to, to CO2 emissions. In contrast, since 2007, emissions from electricity and heat generation have been declining, correlating with the increased use of wind and solar to, to generate electricity. Spain has laid out ambitious and detailed strategies to achieve a complete energy system transformation in which fossil fuels are no longer dominant and end use sectors are mostly electrified with renewable sources. That kind of transformation will come with both new challenges and new opportunities. 
The challenges include energy security. Uh, a large share of variable renewable generation will require new forms of longer term backup on, to on top of short term flexibility. New vulnerabilities could also arise from cyber threats as electrification will be accompanied by increased digitalization. Opportunities will come with energy system integration and new sectors can be coupled with higher electrification, the use of residual heat, waste energy, and the use of electricity to produce renewable gases like, like hydrogen. Um, Spain's strategies are outlined in key policy documents. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. So um, these are supplemented by a number of roadmaps and consultations that will provide greater, greater clarity on the country's climate change ambitions. Spain's National Energy and Climate Plan, which covers the period 2021 to 2030, targets a 23% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 compared to 1990 levels. The latest inventory shows that as of 2018, Spain's emissions were 15.5% above 1990 levels, which indicate that sizable cuts are needed in the coming years to, to meet those targets. The bill on climate change and energy transition was accepted by the government in May of last year and submitted to parliament and will transpose much of the NECP into national law and its targets are similar. The long-term strategy maps out a plan for Spain to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, including internal milestones for 2030 and 2040, defining a pathway toward an almost completely renewable-based energy system. Specifically, Spain, Spain plans to source 100% of its electricity from renewable sources and 97% of final energy consumption for renewables in 2050. The next stage of Spain's task will be to ensure timely implementation and sufficient funding for the various measures outlined in the policy documents to keep progress on track. And transport in particular will need to be prioritized as the largest emitting sector. The NECP has been rightly guided by the energy efficiency first principle. The reduction in primary energy consumption proposed in the plan will require an improvement in the primary energy intensity of the economy of three and a half percent per year until 2030, which is well above the IEA average over the last decade. The National Energy Efficiency Fund created in 2014 is the main instrument to implement measures for financial support and technical assistance to increase energy efficiency across sectors. The fund is mainly financed by contributions from oil, gas, and electricity companies, and it amounts to around 200 million euros per year. Policy documents outline a number of measures in, to improve efficiency and reduce consumption in all economic sectors, including transport, buildings, and industry. The policy plans are extensive and can achieve strong results, but need to be accompanied by predictable long-term regulatory frameworks, sufficient incentives to mobilize private investments, and adequate public financing to underpin all the programs over the coming decade. Strong coordination with Spain's autonomous communities and municipal authorities will also be needed to ensure enactment of efficiency policies and measures given, that, given Spain's decentralized system of government. Spain is progressing toward its 2030 targets, uh, notably in electricity, after a slump in renewables investments between 2013 and 2018 due to changes in support mechanisms, investments have taken off again from 2019, and renewables accounted for nearly 45% of generation in 2020. Though Spain's progress in ramp ramping up renewables in its electricity mix is commendable, the future trajectory of its power mix warrants careful consideration to ensure a smooth um, transition, including interconnections, storage, demand side management, and digitalization, all of which the government is planning. Spain plans to phase out both coal and nuclear power generation with the coal phase out imminent. Natural gas plants currently provide around a third of power generation and will be crucial to balancing out a power system that, that's heavily dependent on variable renewal, renewables. Spain's targets also preview a sizable deployment of new renewables capacity to, to reach 74% um, of electricity generation by 2030, notably for wind and solar. Um, Spain's updated auction mechanisms will help toward this end and investor sentiment and availability of financing appears to be on track. Some additional help can come in the form of expedited permitting and timely issuance of auction schedules um, and terms to improve investment clarity. So far, the uptake of renewables has mostly been limited to the electricity sector. Spain expects to reach a 20% share of renewables in gross final energy consumption in 2020, up from 17% in 2018. 
Reaching the target of 42% by 2030 will require additional effort in particular in the transport and heating and cooling sectors. Um, in order to integrate more renewables into other sectors of the economy, the government has a four-pronged strategy, which includes energy efficiency first, renewables-based electrification, storage, indirect and indirect electrification through renewable gases, mainly hydrogen. The, the government has several initiatives in place or underway to jumpstart plans and investments in the 2030 timeframe, including a hydrogen roadmap, a biogas roadmap, an offshore wind roadmap, a uh, self-consumption strategy, public consultation, and a smart meter evolution public consultation. Electrification of other sectors will be an essential component to meeting Spain's renewable targets. The long-term strategy projects that electrification of the economy will be over 50% by 2050. So the competitiveness of electricity against fossil fuels will be critical to achieving these results. The recently proposed National Fund for the Sustainability of the Electricity System which would redistribute levies associated with renewable subsidies from electricity to energy companies across the energy system is an important step toward this end. So with that, I will turn the floor back over to Dr. Birrell to outline our recommendations for the Spanish government. Thank you very much, uh, Divya. Uh, so I would like to first of all say that uh, since our latest uh, uh, review, it is obvious that the Spanish government made uh, important strides on many fronts. Uh, first of all, uh, a major issue of uh, trade uh, tariff deficits, they have been eliminated. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, coal mining sector uh, is being closed, uh, but with the minimum impact and the, uh, uh, the workers and the uh, communities uh, there, and the uh, huge, again, improvement in terms of the carbonization of its uh, power uh, sector. Just yesterday, I saw uh, the uh, major project on hydrogen was another uh, good uh, example in the uh, right direction. Uh, to, uh, on the base of this progress, we would like to recommend the Spain, uh, first of all, the National Recovery and Resilience Plan uh, to support uh, the achieved uh, Spanish uh, uh, targets. And here, uh, I, Spain has identified some uh, priorities such as efficiency, sustainable mobility, renewable energies, infrastructure, it is uh, a key issue for the uh, IEA storage flexibility, and as I mentioned, green hydrogen. We hope that uh, the nation recovery and resilience plan uh, would uh, uh, provide uh, support to those priorities. Second recommendation uh, we have is the uh, being the Spain uh, having a decentralized uh, system of uh, government. It is uh, critical to improve the coordination uh, among the regional authorities and the uh, municipalities in order to uh, make uh, sure uh, that the, uh, the capacity at all levels of governments are uh, there and is, we believe they are essential to success. Third area is the uh, flexibility with the, uh, in the power uh, system and with the increasing share of the uh, solar and uh, wind, it is uh, uh, critical to have uh, interconnections, storage, demand side management, and uh, digitalization. And uh, this is, uh, from our point of view, this is a, a critical system integration of uh, renewables and also cooperation with the neighboring governments and interconnection capacity we will also help to utilize Spain's full production capacity on renewables, especially uh, with France, uh, where we are uh, today. And a fourth uh, key point from our side is the taxation uh, issue. Spain should uh, consider uh, to make some changes in this taxation system, especially in terms of incorporating the cost of carbon into and use uh, prices, reducing the barriers to increase the penetration of the clean electricity 
and the uh, the recently proposed uh, uh, fund to redistribute electricity, we believe is a step in the right uh, direction. To uh, sum up, uh, Spain made a major uh, improvements in the last uh, few years in terms of decarbonization and also addressing the issues uh, arising from the decarbonization journey in a, a social and a fair uh, way with, which uh, make economic sense. And we are uh, happy to support Spain uh, in its ambitious energy transformation uh, journey. So this is uh, from uh, us. Uh, I would like to now to turn uh, the Madam uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of uh, uh, Ecological Transition uh, for her uh, comments. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, my uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Fatih Birol, for this uh, this great job. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Reddy, for all your contributions and, and support. I think that uh, the first thing I should do is to congratulate uh, the International Energy Agency for the uh, flagship report we launched last week, which is not easy, it is very impressive, and it is pretty demanding. But I think that um, it also points out to what extent uh, we need to, to strive in order to, to make uh, all this transformation available at, uh, at a due time. Starting by a very uh, a, uh, final uh, picture, I would say that uh, dealing with um, your uh, report and your introductory comments, um, we also share your concerns. I think that uh, the risk of uh, rebound is uh, uh, pretty clear. In our case, I'm sure that um, this uh, this very particular year has uh, has been also key in order to phase out coal. So uh, to uh, to a certain extent, a picture of our greenhouse gas emissions connected related to the energy sector uh, will disappear in our inventory of greenhouse gases emissions. But at the same time, we are worried about uh, the evolution of uh, the emissions connected related to transportation, which is not clear to what extent they, they will be evolving in this uh, 2021, as it may happen, some additional rebound in the industry sector. Uh, dealing with uh, your uh, main recommendations that I think are quite important and uh, quite um, quite uh, connected to our own assessments, um, I would say that uh, it could be important to, to stress the consistency between the different um, strategic planning uh, uh, policy policy uh, pieces and um, the orientation of our recovery plans. I will make some comments around this as well as uh, the increasing uh, cooperation uh, lines that uh, we are promoting with the different uh, administrations, regional and local administrations, but also with um, private um, key players. I think that it is important to work on the flexibility of uh, the electricity system, as you say, and this is something we are working to work on the market design and we are doing some interesting things to work on interconnectivity and taking into consideration that you are an international agency. I hope you also recommend this to our French colleagues uh, to stress and to enhance uh, um, and improve uh, the, the interconnection with Spain. We work uh, on the demand side and this is not easy but there are some things happening right now and a new tariffs uh, that also works uh, in this context to, that will enter into force next uh, uh, June 1st and to work on the story. So on taxation I think that this is also a very important field. We have some um, answers not all. We are working on the uh, full understanding of the new fiscal system and it uh, may require some extra time. Then Going to some additional details, um, it's true that we have a very important uh, delivery that uh, has come up in these last weeks. Uh, so after you ended your uh, very uh, uh, important uh, report uh, two weeks ago, the Spanish Parliament approved uh, the new climate change and energy transition law. And it is important. It is the first time that we count on something like this. It includes very relevant uh, references for the time to come. So we have um, established in a law the full decarbonization of our economy um, uh, by 2050 at the latest. We count on uh, some additional references that are important, a long-term 
decarbonization strategy, a, a national energy and climate plan, we we'll talk about it. A, um, more than 50 key measures uh, being approved in the last uh, two years, so to facilitate a deep, and as you said, a fair uh, change in our energy system, and some very interesting goals. 74% of uh, renewable power generation by 2030, 42% of renewable energy in end use energy by 2030, 39.5% uh, energy efficiency improvement by 2030, 39% of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in non ETS sectors. These are not the only goals. I think that um, there are relevant um, measures being included in the in the law, such as, for instance, no new developments of hydrocarbons in Spain, um, uh, no uh, new uh, internal combustion engines cars by 2040 or whenever uh, we decide at the European Union. They, uh, they need not to not to lower our goals, but always to review uh, to improve our goals. The obligations of low emission zones in all cities with uh, 50 thousand inhabitants or more by 2023 uh, and the reporting and uh, the need to divest uh, and to assess the risk uh, connected to climate in any uh, rated company. So I think that a set of measures that will probably change this in, in the years to come. I think that we still need to work in many other uh, relevant fields, but we are convinced that this is this is going to be a very uh, relevant uh, flagship law. We are dealing with efficiency, and this uh, comes back uh, to the um, recovery plans. I will make some comments on this. Uh, we are quite ambitious, including in the regulatory context, so to ensure that we can facilitate a retrofitting uh, buildings plan, uh, including electrified to the extent possible of thermal use in the in the, uh, in the households, the use of domotics to improve the efficiency of the use of energy and the promotion of self-consumption and storage behind the counter uh, at um, the private homes, the integration of electric mobility um, and so on and so on. I think that um, we also need to work and to focus on the mobility model and we need to focus on other fields such as how we can facilitate, how we can come along with uh, the industry sectors in order to improve um, uh, the most efficient possible use of energy, but also the most efficient capacity to move towards decarbonized process in the industrial context, which is not easy. And we think that this needs to be reflected in the uh, recovery plans. And that's what we have tried to do. More than uh, 10,000 million of euros being invested in the energy fields of the recovery plan. Um, the whole green tagging of our recovery plan uh, is more than 40% of uh, the resources. And of course, following the very wise recommendation from the European Commission, 100% of all the all the measures to be to be promoted need to be consistent with the do not significant harm to the environment uh, being proposed by the commission which i think will change the way we design and we identify uh, um, the different strategies and policies and measures not only in the public sector but also in the private uh, sector so i think that this is going to to drive a very significant change in the way we do this, um, this explains why I think uh, um, the, um, the previous understanding of the, the strategic milestones, together with the public consultation on how to define the pathways, um, have been properly reflected in the recovery plan. Uh, it is consistent within the different pieces of the recovery plan, and it is consistent with our main goal to accelerate, to facilitate the transformation in a manner that provides opportunities and takes care of the social aspects of this great transformation. Some of the fields that uh, we have included in our plans are the retrofitting goals, the mobility uh, pattern goals, the uh, deployment, massive deployment of um, solutions based on renewable energy in a decentralized manner, the investment in the smart grids, the uh, the promotion of innovative uh, solutions in renewable energy solutions, the uh, relevant weight of storage. So till, till the moment we are fully interconnected with the rest of Europe, my impression is that um, 
Portugal and Spain will be leading this um, storage um, a, a, a pathway because of uh, the need to do so, to, to rely, to have to count on a reliable system. Um, the green hydrogen and the gas transition. These are the main drivers. Uh, and in addition, as I said, some references to the industrial sector, to the tourism sector, or the agriculture sector. But um, these are the most relevant aspects uh, that we try to cover in our recovery plan. I think that uh, we still have some references to, to be uh, deepened um, on uh, the main fields of action. The main fields of action, as many others in the world, are efficiency, electrification, and deployment of renewable energy solutions. But at that, there are some challenges dealing with the market design and dealing with the social impacts of the transformation, including uh, some things that we already know, as the just transition or the energy poverty, but some other issues such as the social impact and the uh, consideration of the endogenous resources when deployment, when the deployment, when, in, when promoting the deployment of the renewable energy solutions. So the local aspects dealing with landscapes, with biodiversity and the social impact of this distribution. And finally, an increasing discussion on what to do with the carbon dividend when we are facing an increasing price of carbon that impacts in the whole energy system, even on those technologies that are not emis are uh, non-emitting technologies. So this, this is part of our agenda uh, to come. Some key regulatory default developments have already been achieved, such as uh, um, the, uh, the regulation of the energy storage, the capacity markets, the local energy communities, uh, the, uh, the development of the demand aggregation, uh, the new uh, auction systems, including calendars, so to facilitate positive impacts uh, in the capacity to anticipate the demands in the industry sector, but also to facilitate the certainty, the confidence, the reliability on uh, the developers and promoters um, operators. We think that uh, this, this will facilitate uh, the mobilization of resources and investments and we think that uh, this explains why uh, the new model of uh, auctions uh, has been a success when, when we solved, when we decided on uh, um, this first renewable auction in, in last, uh, in last uh, January. But as I said, I think that there are some other issues to be taken into consideration. I think that um, as, uh, as Mrs. Reddy uh, has already stated, the idea to promote this new national fund for the sustainability of the electricity system does help to provide uh, some price signals, but also the idea of um, uh, using all energy drivers to facilitate the funding, the, the development of uh, the, the first round of uh, renewable energy solutions. Um, but um, I, I guess uh, that uh, the, it is also important to stress that this is going to take shape in a way that uh, is um, acceptable by all. So paying attention to those consumers that may be more vulnerable because they rely much more on the use of gas and, um, and oil for their uh, working needs um, and uh, to the operators by ensuring a uh, smooth enter into uh, the new system along uh, five years with a great uh, positive impact in the final consumer um, in five years, more than 12% of uh, reduction of the electricity bill, but as I said, in a smooth way, so to facilitate the transition. Um, adding to that, I say, as, as, as I said, um, we, we are working in the market design and we will uh, come back uh, with some proposals so to facilitate some possibilities on the carbon dividend. And we are working on how to ensure that uh, the implementation of the renewable energy is easily um, or consistent with other public interests that uh, may raise concern in the local, in the local communities. I have to say that uh, dealing with the consideration that you have very wisely stated, 
the, the need to, to improve uh, all the synergies, positive synergies uh, among the different levels of the administration. We are working hard. We think that it is important to work with the different levels of administration um, in the design, in the operationalization, in the implementation, and in the follow up of what it means, the energy transition at the local level. So, what about the solar? Roofs, what about um, the, um, the, uh, the communities of energy, what about the, the improvement of the efficiency patterns, what about the permitting, as you said, and what about the follow-up of the implementation of the recovery plans. Um, not only that, I think that innovation is key and innovation is a big driver, a positive driver for employment and for the energy transition. And it applies a little bit everywhere. So we have um, identified some key some key figures, goals in renewable energy uh, installments, so more than 60 gigawatts by 2030, new additional 60 gigawatts, 6 gigawatts of storage capacity by 2030, 4 gigawatts on hydrogen, and the, um, the, uh, the capacity to facilitate uh, the uh, in an anticipated manner of information, so to be ready. Uh, to, to, to buy in, to digest um, all, these, all these opportunities. Yesterday, we made some, some additional innovations. Yesterday, we made available our draft uh, regulation on how to fit in a public tender the, uh, the positive effects of energy transition in concrete local areas. So, in those villages being affected by the phase out of coal plants, how we can facilitate uh, the transformation of the local economy through uh, the access to the grid whenever creating new renewable energy capacity. Uh, so we have um, proposed to make these uh, tenders for these very concrete uh, placements uh, by stating that we will take into consideration other uh, public interest uh, economy, uh, conditionalities through, such uh, as uh, how uh, the new plans or the new possibilities to integrate and to coexist with um, the endogenous resources and how much they impact positively with um, the creation of new local opportunities in the local economy and in the employment. So let's see how it works. I think we are we are willing to, to have the reactions from the local communities for the time being. What we are witnessing is very interesting proposals and much interest and positive expectations from all the different players. The, um, private companies, the, uh, the local authorities, the regional authorities, but also the inhabitants and the former workers of those coal plants in phase out. On uh, taxation, as I have already stated, we are working on that. Some first signals, we will still need to work in the time to come. But I, uh, I, I get your uh, proposal and uh, it will be our great pleasure not just to follow the uh, good recommendations you have stated and conclusions, but also to keep uh, to keep in touch with uh, with the team of the International Energy Agency. So to see how far, uh, how fast, and how deep um, we can learn together with you, other positive uh, indicators, indications coming from your team to improve um, our energy policies in the time to come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister, for your uh, comments. And thank you, Dr. Birol and uh, Divya. It's now time for the Q&A uh, part of our um, presentation. We will take a very short break so we can compile the questions and come uh, right back to you. Uh, for the uh, members of the media um, on the call, can you please send your questions through the Q&A box? We will be uh, with you uh, in a moment. Thank you.
So we've compiled a number of questions and in the interest of time, um, Madam Minister, I will read the uh, questions. Um, there are uh, two questions for you that I will start with and then a third question for Dr. Birol. First question from Pablo Bronte from Montel News. Question uh, uh, is, is the Spanish government working on additional interconnections on top of Biscay, Aragon, Catalonia, new projects? Uh, Follow-up question is, when could we see the new Aragon and Navarre interconnectors online before 2030, question mark. And the uh, second question for yourself as well is, how will Spain use post-COVID recovery funding to support uh, your energy transition? Um, and the third question, uh, if I may, for Dr. Birol, uh, what can developed countries, including Spain, do to assist developing countries to enhance emission reduction ambitions? Madam Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, in, in fact, as um, a, uh, many of you know, the issue of the interconnections with France is a long uh, issue, uh, not easy. Um, it's true that to a certain extent, the storage, uh, the self-consumption, uh, the local communities um, do, do help to, 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 to shape a different model, but we still need to strengthen our, our interconnections. And we um, are uh, pretty delayed for several reasons, um, normally because of uh, different concerns being expressed by, uh, by different players in, in France more than, than, than any other issue. But sometimes there are also local concerns coming from other regions in Spain. Uh, for the time being, our first goal is to fulfill the, um, the, uh, the interconnection in the Biscay Gulf, which is um, which goes uh, far beyond what uh, we were expecting. Um, and then, yes, of course, we need to work in the central and eastern interconnections, which are not easy either. But um, as I said, uh, we, we, uh, we work uh, closely with the French government and the French uh, operator of the grid so to ensure that uh, the technical issues may uh, be solved um, uh, in the best possible way in the uh, shortest uh, possible term, which is, uh, which is um, sometimes a little bit more difficult than what we would like to, to, to see. Um, on the post-COVID um, energy recovery, sorry, in the post-COVID um, recovery plans, I could say that energy uh, plays a very important role. Um, I say that uh, it is more than 10,000 million euros being invested in, uh, in energy, direct energy investments or energy related activities. So to improve efficiency in households in industry or other economic sectors or innovation in the energy field or a, um, innovation in the circular economy fields connected, not only with the use of energy, but also with the uh, circular economy and waste management of um, electronics uh, dealing with photovoltaics or uh, materials dealing with um, wind generators and so on. So I think that it is quite interesting how it applies uh, a little bit everywhere. Just to provide some examples, more than 1,500 million uh, to to develop uh, the green hydrogen in three years, uh, more than um, a, uh, 2,000 euros uh, being uh, invested in the transformation of uh, the mobility towards um, electrical mobility, including infrastructure for uh, electrical mobility, uh, and uh, more than 8,000 euros dealing with, um, with uh, buildings. Not only retrofitting buildings, but a um, big share of that deals, of course, with energy retrofitting buildings. Um, then there is a very interesting program on the innovation in new renewable energy solutions, including uh, some references to what uh, it could be important, uh, storage, uh, um, smart grids, and offshore uh, floating uh, um, uh, um, when the, uh, in our case. Uh, so I think that, uh, yes, this is something that has been deeply appreciated by the European Commission, how consistent the different fields of action are among themselves, uh, how it is uh, conceived in order to accelerate uh, the goals dealing with climate and energy. Last comment, which is very important too, is the need to be sure that we skill and re-skill 
our workers. Um, I witness with concern that we may be lacking some key capacities in order to put in place such an ambitious and interesting transformation of our economy. Um, and it applies or it may apply uh, to the need of skilled workers in the, in the building sector, but it also applies to uh, skilled workers in the energy sector, energy and digitalized sectors, because it is increasingly interconnected. So I think that um, this is something where um, we also need to make our big bet. And this is also included to a certain extent in our recovery plan, how to prepare our youth, but also how to come along with uh, workers in this field that uh, do want to have a, an opportunity to still be workers, even if their traditional field of action is changing very, very rapidly. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, 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 Madam Minister. The question for me is how can the developed countries can support the developing countries in terms of emission reductions? So first of all, starting with the fact that the uh, emissions going to atmosphere from uh, Madrid or from Jakarta or from Detroit, it has the same effect on everybody. Even uh, European, for example, EU emissions would go to zero tomorrow if the others do not uh, reduce their emissions. The, uh, the climate impact on uh, Europe uh, will be more or less the same. So therefore, it is only rational uh, that there is an international collaboration among the countries. This is one of the key areas that we have highlighted in our net zero report we published uh, last uh, week. Now, if you look at the entire picture, today the nerve center is uh, financing clean energy in emerging countries. This is the biggest uh, problem because in Europe and in North America, with some difficulties, money will meet the clean energy options. Of course, there are many hurdles, but the uh, so, uh, like the, uh, the uh, Spanish government, able governments will find ways to money go there. But when it comes to the countries in Asia, Africa and elsewhere, we have major uh, uh, challenges. And as such, uh, I hope two things in terms of the finding international mechanisms in order to support those uh, countries while they are those countries preparing their domestic investment framework to attract the money. And the second one is the uh, technology cooperation between the uh, developed and developing uh, countries uh, among others. So uh, as we said in our uh, report, there's a race to uh, zero, but unless everybody finishes this race, nobody wins the race. So it is the reason we uh, are uh, very keen to see this international collaboration. I think with this, we are going to finish our uh, meeting. Many thanks to uh, Madam uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Many thanks to the Spanish government for the help. We will be at the disposal of the uh, Spanish government if they want further uh, details. And I see there are many questions from the uh, press. We are going to send them email uh, to respond to those with the help of our Spanish uh, colleagues as well. And finally, uh, 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 Teresa, uh, we are following the uh, your public statements very closely, like all other uh, 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 ministers of our uh, member countries. One of them didn't go unnoticed by me that, uh, that you, last weekend you sent a message uh, the congratulate Atletico Madrid. So also congratulations from me uh, that the uh, uh, well-deserved uh, title for Atletico. And uh, we wish you all the best and your colleagues uh, Looking forward to working with you uh, close. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you. Mm -hmm.